The Galapagos uh, lies about 700 miles off the coast of Ecuador, uh, right on the equator, a uh, volcanic island group. Uh, and uh, over the centuries, of, over the millenniums actually, uh, various species uh, have evolved there that have come onto the island and have changed. Uh, and that's why, you know, when Charles Darwin uh, came there, it was such a, a natural laboratory for studying uh, mutations because uh, the species there are absolutely unique from anywhere else on the planet because there's so much isolation. The um, oceans really are the repository of a uh, biodiversity on this planet and uh, it's the living oceans that make it possible to have life on land. Uh, if we diminish diversity in our oceans then we uh, diminish our ability to survive overall on the planet. Back in the 90s, we got some um, letters from uh, people who were in the Galapagos saying, uh, you know, things that are happening here are not very good. Um, you know, there, there's more and more illegal fishing. Uh, there's a lot of problems. So in 1999, we decided to, uh, to stop by there on our way um, up to the Panama Canal. We just took a short detour and I brought our ship, the Ocean Warrior, there and we stopped and we met with the uh, with the uh, director of the national parks, and that's when I made an offer. I said, well, you know, would you like a patrol boat? They didn't have the means, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the ships, so they asked our assistance, and we, we gave them the, 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 the Serenian, one of our ships, which we had back then. We gave that to the park on a five-year lease, and it was patrolling the marine reserve, and in those five years, they were able to catch a lot of illegal fishermen uh, fishing inside the marine reserve. Fishermen have devastated uh, ecosystems all around the planet, and now the richest ecosystems, the ones that uh, are, are so attractive to them, are the marine reserves, not just the Galapagos, Cocos Island, Mapello Island, uh, islands all over the world where they've actually been set aside as uh, marine reserves. This is, where, this is where the fish are. I mean, it was a Willie Horton, this bank robber, once was asked, well, why do you rob banks? And he says, well, that's where the money is. And that's why fishermen go to marine reserves. That's where the fish are. One of the biggest threats that the oceans face is uh, shark finning, so the fishing for uh, the fins of sharks. All over the world they are hunting down these magnificent creatures and uh, they bring them on board and they simply cut off their fins, their tail fins, their dorsal fins and throw the rest of the animal away, sometimes alive.
80 to 90 million sharks are killed every year on average, uh, primarily for shark fins, and there's an increasing demand, especially in China, for uh, shark fin soup, because shark fin soup used to be considered a, a sign of affluence. And with more and more affluence uh, growing in, in China, more and more people want to impress each other by, by having the status symbol dish. And so once where it was the dish of the very, very wealthy, it's now becoming a rather common dish. Sharks have uh, literally shaped evolution in our oceans for 450 million years. So that means that every fish you see, its camouflage, its speed, its behavior has been influenced by the shark in that environment. It's an apex predator. It's absolutely essential for a healthy ecosystem. And when you diminish shark populations, you diminish the system as a whole. last four years I've been working here we've been uh, what we've been doing is reinforce the uh, the existing local uh, law enforcement agencies like the National Park the uh, Ecuadorian Navy the Ecuadorian police so we provide them with uh, equipment we provide them with money personnel knowledge and we try to develop programs together with them we have Marcel doing the AES project and the radio project we have Hugo in charge of the legal project we have Malena in charge of the um, of the educational project and also of the uh, canine unit The canine unit was founded in 2008 and one of the reasons that we founded it was because we had some major busts uh, of, of wildlife smuggling taking place on the continent in 2007 uh, when Sea Shepherd together with the police uh, was able to, uh, to catch about 90,000 sea cucumbers on the continent and about 18,000 shark fins. Sea Shepherd uh, in cooperation with the, uh, with the police, the Ecuadorian police, help them to uh, set up this unit, which is unique in South America. It's the only unit that actually focuses on the detection of uh, illegal wildlife. We've been here in the Galapagos since 2006 and working with the police uh, pretty much from the beginning. So for us, you know, to see the police waiting for us at the dock with the dogs and to do an inspection, it's just a, yeah, it's just a reminder of why we're doing this and, you know, to see to see them receive us the way they do and, and to see that we're basically just, just, just you know, friends in work. So for, for Ecuador to have the canine unit inside their boundaries and specifically for Galapagos to have this unit is extremely important. And Sea Shepherd obviously is very proud to be, uh, to be part of this. I'm Elena Garcia. I'm from Ecuador. I was born in Quito, the capital of my country. We decided to work on environmental education because we believe that if we do not educate the people, if we do not inform the people what's happening about the sharks, of course they will never know uh, what they have to protect. Malena is doing a really important job here, educating the youth of Galapagos about the uh, sharks because we've worked in various projects trying to complement each other and, and education is one of the pillars of our work here in the Galapagos. We went school by school, grade by grade, from children that are in the age from 8 to 14 years old. And what we did is 
to present some videos about how nice the sharks are uh, swimming in the ocean. I also explained to them what, what the things that are, they are facing at the moment, like illegal fisheries, the shark finning, and all those things really shock them. You have to see their faces. Some of them are like almost crying when they see our videos or the pictures that we are showing. And immediately they want to stop that and they want to be part of the solution, like being the warriors protecting the, the, the sharks. Bravo! I chose to become an environmental lawyer um, simply because I'm, I have always been connected uh, to nature. I live in a wonderful country full of life, full of biodiversity, and I respect that. It's, you know, it's only logical for me to defend what I have and to appreciate what I have and to use my, my, my work and my knowledge for, uh, for, a, for an important cause, for an important issue. I love being a lawyer from as long as I can remember because I simply don't like injustice. I believe in law enforcement and I believe in the power that people, not authority, that people, individuals, have in changing things by using the law. Hugo is our legal advisor. He's an Ecuadorian lawyer who, uh, who specializes in criminal and environmental law. And he's, he's one of the authorities in Ecuador when it comes to the application of criminal environmental law. So for us as Sea Shepherd to have an environmental lawyer, not only to target the problems that we have here, but also to be of advice to Sea Shepherd is extremely important. I have always had this interest of using um, criminal um, law as a tool for conservation. So it happens that Sea Shepherd shares the same interest. Um, they want to protect the sharks here in the Galapagos. And I told him, well, you know, it happens that I want to see the law being enforced. And if the law says that sharks have to be protected, well, you know, let's join forces and work together for the same cause. And, and you got to realize Ecuador as a country is the first country in the world that has a constitution that gives right, actual rights to nature. So all the laws are in place, but what we're lacking at the moment is, is competent judges to apply these laws. And that, that's what we're trying to accomplish with the legal project. We're standing here on the dock in uh, San Cristobal Island and behind us you see uh, a whole bunch of boats. You see a Navy ship just over there. Next to the Navy ships there's the uh, Femory One, the, uh, the shark finners that were caught uh, a couple months ago. And next to that is the uh, Reina del Cisne, that's another uh, shark finning boat that was caught a couple of days ago here in the Marine Reserve, uh, about eight miles inside the Marine Reserve. And they have about 70 sharks on board. And we're just about to go on board and uh, see for ourselves and get a first-hand account of uh, the destruction that took place. Thank you.
yeah, this is this is devastating. I mean, this is so sad. You know, it's like opening up a it's opening up a mass grave. Because that's what it is. You just open up a mass grave, and all these corpses are coming out. And there, you know, there's juveniles, there's there's adults, male, female. It's just completely indiscriminate, and it's a massacre. It's horrible. Unfortunately, the impact on the environment is is, is quite severe. You know, the, these sharks are you know, part of the Galapagos ecosystem, and taking these emblematic animals from the Galapagos Marine Reserve is, is lowering the population, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, I mean, this, this is going to affect, uh, this is going to affect populations throughout the Galapagos of sharks, and, and you know, this is not the only case, as you can see next, next to us is the family number one, which, which killed even more sharks, it's, it's unbelievable. So this obviously is uh, what brings in a lot of market, uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, money up on the market. Uh, people, uh, this is why people are doing this for this. Part of an animal that is killed for a tasteless bowl of soup. You gotta stop. It's important to note that here is um, you have several state institutions coordinating, working in coordination. That's very good because it makes them stronger. You have here the police, the, the environmental police, the judicial police. You have here the navy, the national park, and uh, this act is being uh, the leader is the um, prosecutor's office, the environmental prosecutor's office. So everybody is working is working together. All the uh, details of these sharks are being written down, like uh, what species, male, female, length. Samples are being taken, and now we're uh, taking, uh, taking off the mooring lines that are uh, being tied up to the other uh, shark poacher next to us. And we'll take the ship about 10 miles out and, uh, and return these animals, uh, these beautiful animals, back to, uh, to where they live. Unfortunately, we uh, have to bury them. I just cannot understand uh, in my legal logic how these things could happen, how judges could even think about 
saying that they are not, uh, they don't have the power to analyze this, this type of cases in a province like Galapagos, which whose 90% of the protected area is, as it says, protected. This is clear evidence that something is going really wrong, wrong when it comes to judicial response to environmental matters here in Galapagos. And uh, if this time something is, uh, uh, doesn't change for good, then we for sure will have uh, lost um, a great opportunity for change. But I'm confident, I have to say, because this, uh, what, is, what has happened in the past months, uh, as far as judicial response of environmental cases, gives clear evidence that there is a problem here that needs to be urgently, immediately addressed. As simple as that. Then we have Marcel Wensveen from Holland. He's in charge of the AES project. We're building a network based on a radio signal, a big network that we're placing all over the archipelago, which allows us to monitor every single vessel movement in the marine reserve. For me, Marcel was a logical choice. As soon as we got the funding for it, there was simply no question in my mind that I would ask Marcel to do this. Marcel came to us as a volunteer he volunteered for about six months installing the, uh, the radio project for the police. He built repeater sites, he went up mountains, up in antenna masts, and seeing his enthusiasm and his, his, his passion about what we're doing, and, and he's become a really, uh, he's become a true Sea Shepherd uh, uh, crew member over the years. If you need to define very basically what the AAS network is in Galapagos, then you have uh, basically three things. You have two control centers. You have the network, which is actually providing the data to the control centers. And you have the boats. Uh, when you want to have 100% coverage in a landscape like this with huge volcanoes, uh, then you have to make a good layout where you put your base stations. And after doing some research, we found out that if we put it in nine high points, then eventually we were close to 100% coverage. When we have all nine sites running, we'll have a full network and we'll, yeah, we'll see every vessel that already has AAS. And that's the first step. The, the next phase will be to, uh, to get all these small boats to install AAS as well. And then yeah, in no time we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pretty much see every single vessel move around and that's going to be a glor glorious moment of course for us. We think that AAS is going to be a major tool uh, to stop uh, poachers even thinking of coming to Galapagos. What's happening is that we officially uh, include the Sierra Negra of the National Park Galapagos to the Sea Shepherd fleet. Bob Barker, Steve Irwin, Brigitte Bardot, Sierra Negra.
The installation of AAS is a big step for Galapagos. Is it safer for the animals? I think you can say yes. Is it uh, clear to other people uh, what the capabilities are for the park and for the marine? Yes, we will work on that one. We will tell them, if you come, we are going to see you. You better don't come. For me as an activist, it was a huge change to, uh, to leave the ships where I've been on for five years and start working here on the Galapagos. Because the work here is, can be very, very political at times. On the other hand, this is the way uh, it works. And you know, we've, we've proven that it works and we're getting somewhere that we've never been before. So this is the, the way to, uh, to tackle the problem in the Galapagos. And I'm very happy to be able to defend this, uh, this beautiful place. First of all, we have all the rules, the laws, the treaties, and regulations we need to protect our oceans. What we don't have is the um, motivation on the part of governments to enforce and uphold those laws. There simply is no profit in it. It's the tragedy of the commons. Anything out there offshore in that uh, sort of no man's land of the oceans is a free-for-all. People do whatever they want. The problem is, is for the most part, it's out of sight and out of mind. People don't even think about it because we're land-dwelling creatures. But the oceans provide everything that makes life possible. It's really quite simple. If the oceans die, we die. <laughs>